Well, I have the pleasure of introducing um, one of the keynotes, the keynote, uh, Dr. PJ Devereaux. And if you look here, PJ and I met some 15 years ago, probably longer than that. Um, and there's a couple of pictures here that I think both of us probably remember. Uh, and the Clarity Group has grown uh, since that period of time to probably double the size you see even eight years ago. But today, uh, PJ and uh, Dr. Borges are going to speak to one issue, a new paradigm to improve the safety of all major surgeries. Although there is evidence of surgery occurring back as far as 2500 BC, history suggests that there have been only two major paradigm changes that have actually dramatically improved the safety of all major surgeries. Both of these changes were discovered in roughly the 1840s, and their research has uncovered what they believe has the potential to represent the third paradigm. In fact, this third paradigm could dramatically improve the safety and efficacy of all major surgery. It's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Dr. PJ Deborah, who is professor of the Department of Medicine in the Division of Cardiology at McMaster University. He's a scientific leader of anesthesiology, perioperative medicine, and surgical research group at PHRI. Welcome, PJ. Well, thanks so much for uh, having me, and it's a great privilege to be here. I was noticing in those pictures when I first met you, I didn't have any gray hair before I encountered you and started doing some orthopedic research. Um, <laughs> when I, you know, I'm a researcher. I, I don't want to say that there's association is causation, but I have my <laughs> suspicions here. Um, Very astute so, observations. I love it. <laughs> um, so I would like to first start off by uh, having the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Uh, Flavia Kessler Borges. Um, uh, Flavia is a general internist. She's originally from Brazil. We were very fortunate that Flavia came and did a um, research fellowship with us, and now she's come on faculty here in Hamilton. Um, Flavia really was um, a key leader in making the HIP attack one trial happen, which I suspect many of your orthopedic colleagues will know about. And she's playing a leadership role in terms of the HIP attack two trial. Um, and um, Flavia has been a delight to work with. Um, Flavia as I said, as a general internist, but she's a perioperative care physician, and she also has a PhD in clinical epidemiology. And um, Flavia is going to um, start us off in the talk tonight. So I'm just going to switch screens here, Mo. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes. We can, thanks. Okay, okay, Flavia. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Devereaux, for the kind introduction and also Dr. Mohit Brandari for the opportunity to, to be here and to be discussing this interesting topic on why do people uh, die after surgery and provide some discussion on new insights. So um, our goals of this presentation are to understand when and where surgical complications occur learn historical perspective on major paradigm shifts that have improved surgical safety, as well as gain insights into potential next paradigm change. So I'll start with the case. An 83-year-old female with history of hypertension and 20-pack year history of smoking, she quit 30 years ago. There was no history of coronary artery disease, no strokes, no peripheral vascular disease, and a normal ejection fraction. She had a rectovaginal fistula, and uh, she was scheduled for an elective surgery on the February 7th, and in the morning of surgery, she took her medication, a condesartan, as usual. She underwent a low anterior resection, low ileostomy, with vaginal wall resection. OR started 1825 and ended 2200. Intraoperatively, she had a systolic blood pressure of 80 for 10 minutes and 90 for 20 minutes. Postoperatively, she also had epidural and IV running at 125 cc's per hour. When the patient arrived at the surgical floor, one hour after surgery, heart rate was 91 and blood pressure was 110 over 55. Next time vitals were checked, um, five hours later, systolic blood pressure was 78 and the nurse called the resident and he ordered 500 cc bolos and he was about to see the patient as soon as he would be out of the OR. Two hours and a half later, heart rate is 76, blood pressure 70 over 38. She called this resident again, he's still in the OR and he comes up by 8 a.m when the pressure is still low, systolic is 75, 
diastolic is 36, hemoglobin is 94. The resident ar arrives, he orders one unit of red blood cell transfusion as well as an ECG. So the preoperative ECG is shown on the screen and as you can see, it's pretty much unremarkable. However, the ECG that he requested in post-op day one shows some dramatic ischemic changes. So you can appreciate here that there is a QS pattern in V1 and V2. There's ST depression across anterolateral leads as well as ST elevation on AVR. And these changes are very concerning for high risk myocardial infarction. Although um, uh, the patient was managed, the systolic blood pressure was still low, running on 60s, the coldest call. She was admitted to CCU. She was started on inotropes and fluids, blood pressure normalized, and troponin was elevated. Patient was now out of opioids and she started having chest pain for at least 20 minutes. The patient went to the cath lab. She had a 85% mid LED occlusion and she did receive a bare metal stent. So although the patient survived, it was a near miss and the course could have been different if we had a better monitoring as well as a physician available to manage the hemodynamic changes. So globally, we have uh, more than 230 million patients undergoing surgery annually. The vision study enrolled 40,000 patients. It was a prospective cohort of a representative sample of patients with 45 years old or greater who underwent non-cardiac surgery in 28 centers and 14 countries. In vision 30-day mortality, was 1.8%. And only 0.7 of patients died in the OR where patients should be most vulnerable. However, 70% of patients that die, died during the index admission after surgery. And most remarkable, a third of patients died after being discharged home, suggesting that we need a better transition of care. Also, we had 6% readmissions to hospital within 30 days, and 20% of the patients had ER visits 30 days after surgery. So uh, this slide shows you a risk-adjusted model uh, for 30-day mortality, adjusted for preoperative variables, surgical variables, and also postoperative complications. You can see in the first column, the postoperative complications independently associated with 30-day mortality and how frequent they are. The second column shows the proportion of death associated with that specific complication. The third column is the adjusted hazard ratio, and the fourth column is the attributable fraction. So the attributable fraction is the most important um, column in this table because it tells you that if this complication is truly associated with mortality, the proportion of death that this complication is responsible for. So as you can see, we have three complications that stand out, which are major bleeding, myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery, and sepsis. Altogether, they are dominant drivers of death 30 days after surgery, and they are responsible for 45% of deaths. Um, most people think that uh, venous thromboembolism is an important complication, and that's true because it's independently associated with mortality, as you can see here, with a hazard ratio of 2.2. However, venous thromboembolism nowadays is uncommon because we work on early mobility and also prophylaxis. In vision, only 299 patients had venous thromboembolism, and we can compare with MINS that happened in 5,200 patients. So we do need to target major bleeding, MINS, and sepsis to prevent complications and prevent death after surgery. So now I'll hand over to Dr. Devereaux and I'll thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Flavia. So um, I'm interested in history and um, I'm now gonna give you the world according to PJ. Um, so you, you might want to uh, have some caution about that, but in my reading of a number of surgical books and books on also the history of anesthesia and, just, and articles on it too, in my mind so far, I think there's been two fundamental paradigm shifts that have dramatically improved the safety of surgery. And I want to be clear about a point first, is that I'm talking about things that affected all major surgeries. There have been many advances within individual surgeries with techniques that have really been important advances within that discipline, but I'm talking about global things that improve surgical safety. And um, what is interesting, I think, from my perspective on history around surgery is that the 1840s were a really important time period in the history of surgery because two things started to happen that would become that would result in two paradigm shifts that would be very dramatic now the first one um, relates to the issue of uh, sterile technique and this picture that you see here on the slide this is a picture of uh, joseph lister joseph lister was a surgeon who trained in the uk he then spent most of his career in scotland and um, he was obsessed with the issue of sepsis now at that time in the 1840s, germ theory was still not established. They recognized that a lot of patients after surgery had these red inflamed wounds and there was pus and a lot of these patients died, but they didn't know why because they didn't yet understand about bacteria. And one of the things that actually had a big influence on actually increasing the rates of sepsis at the time was that this was also before anesthesia existed. And because this was before anesthesia existed, a very common thing that had to exist in surgery and a measure of a great surgeon was how fast you were. And um, because you didn't have time, because patients would be in crazy pain whenever you did surgery. And a very common operation at, at that time was amputations. So you can imagine, you know, if there's any resonance on, on, on this uh, webinar, just thinking about doing an amputation on a patient not receiving an anesthetic and how that might go. Um, so what surgeons would do at the time, because they didn't have anesthetic and speed was so important, is they would commonly go into the um, cadaver room, they would rehearse and practice the surgery just prior to the OR on a cadaver, and then walk into the OR, they wouldn't wash their hands because they still didn't know about bacteria, they wouldn't change their clothes, and then they would do the surgery. Now, Joseph Lister, as it turns out, is a world famous surgeon who ended up playing a really important role in this whole concept of sterile technique. But I will also offer this insight that should hopefully make you feel good about your own clinical practice. There's a report that at one time, Joseph Lister was doing an amputation. And Joseph Lister was known uh, to be one of the fastest surgeons of all time. It was reputed that he could commonly do an amputation in less than a minute, including sewing up the skin and closing the wounds. In one of these cases where he came from the cadaver room, he walked in, he sawed off a patient's leg, and he sutured up the wound. He did it in less than a minute, but in the process, he also sawed off his assistant's finger. Now, as a result of this, both the patient and his assistant both got sepsis and both of them died. And one person who, because at that time, surgery was open for anyone to come watch, there was a spectator who saw someone getting their finger sawed off and the leg being removed who also fainted and also apparently died of shock. So in this case, three people died. So we had a 300% mortality rate on this case. So I guess the good news is um, for residents, no matter what you do in the OR, you're probably not gonna surpass um, uh, Lester's um, you know, outcome in this case. Um, but Lester, who was obsessed with this issue of sepsis, um, was also buddies with Louis Pasteur. And he started to wonder if in fact, they were bringing something from the cadaver room into the ORs and maybe this was causing sepsis. And then he ended up being at the forefront of you know, issues around both washing your hands, but also cleaning wounds. And this was a major you know, impact on overall surgical safety. And so research at the time showing surgical mortality rates dropping from 46% to 15% with washing hands and starting to use sterile techniques of cleaning wounds. And as a result of this, Joseph Lister, um, many of us use Listerine, that is named after Joseph Lister, um, because of his uh, background in this whole issue of aseptic areas. The second um, major paradigm shift, I believe that it happened, also started around the 1840s, and it was with the introduction of anesthesia. 
And I believe that anesthesiologists have also played this very fundamental role in changing the overall safety of all surgery. And what is remarkable about the story of anesthesia is that when you look 100 years ago, large research shows that um, one in 1,500 surgical cases, a patient would die from an anesthetic complication. Despite the fact at that time, surgery was mainly conducted on young people with very little comorbidity. And in today's world, we primarily do surgery on older patients with lots of comorbidity. Research supports in 2015 that one in 200,000 surgical cases die of an anesthetic complication. But the question becomes, how did all this great advance happen? And as Flavia showed you a moment ago, almost no one dies in the OR, even though that should be the highest risk period. So what allowed for this enormous progress in intraoperative care that we've not yet realized in postoperative care? And I put forward to you that I think like many things, um, it's often more than one thing, but I would put forward to you that what I think um, actually happened here is that it was physicians, the anesthetist being present in the OR and being responsible for the patient's physiological stability to allow the surgeon to focus on doing their craft and doing, or, you know, in surgery. And at the same time, what anesthesiologists did, especially throughout the last three decades, is they brought intense monitoring into the OR. So ORs now look like ICUs. And those two combination of things dramatically improved intraoperative safety and have always re almost removed intraoperative mortality. Um, yet this still remains an issue, as Flavia has shown you, in postoperative care. Now, what is the reality of um, postoperative care? Well, in postoperative care, in hospital, patients are usually cared by their surgeon. And the reality is, surgeons are often doing what they love doing, which is surgery. And as the case that Flavia showed, is that sometimes patients start getting into trouble just as people are starting a case. And obviously, people can't leave the case. They have to finish the case. And um, this can lead to, to trouble. And after discharge, patients are typically seen um, between two and eight weeks after surgery. This varies by surgeon and also varies by surgical discipline. And when we look at monitoring in hospitals, um, patients typically have vital, chine, vital signs checked every four to eight hours. And the reality is in Hamilton, it's typically every six hours. So you're really hoping in a patient post anesthetic who's getting narcotics without a normal alert mechanism that the nurse happens to magically arrive three minutes after the patient starts, you know, having decreased blood pressure or oxygen saturation and recognize it and does something about it. But obviously that is wishful thinking in many ways. And after discharge, patients typically don't have any monitoring until they're seen in the next follow-up clinic. Um, when we look at um, what are the effects of some of this um, suboptimal uh, monitoring and look at epoxia, we did a study um, where we took 833 patients who went to a surgical floor. We had a monitor on these patients that was capturing data in the background that no one knew about, and nurses were told to measure vitals as they normally did. In this study, the nurses told us in their routine measuring of vitals that 5% of the patients developed an oxygen saturation 90%, less than 90% and had hypoxia. When we focused on the 95% of the patients who the nurses said did not have hypoxia, what our monitor showed us was that 38% of the patients had at least one continuous episode of an oxygen saturation less than 90% that lasted in a continuous duration for at least one hour, and at least 10% of patients had at least one episode where their oxygen saturation was less than 85% for at least one hour. So a lot of patients had significant hypoxia that was not appreciated clinically. When we look at the issue of uh, hypotension, Dan Sesler, who we work uh, very closely with at the Cleveland Clinic, did a study where he used the Soterra blood pressure monitoring cuff. And here again, he showed compared to routine care, a lot of patients on surgical floors had significant hypotension. It was delayed being recognized or in some cases not recognized at all. And if we look at um, the issue of uh, monitoring for myocardial um, ischemia, in vision, we demonstrated that 93% of the patients um, had myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery, did not experience ischemic symptoms, and these patients' events um, would go unrecognized if it wasn't, in fact, for measuring troponins. And patients who have asymptomatic myocardial injuries after surgery have a substantial increase in the probability they're going to die in the first 30 days after surgery. We've also recently done work looking at the issue of suboptimal monitoring and covert stroke and cognitive decline. And what we see in this work is that 
In neurovision, we included 1,114 patients who were age 65 or greater and had an elective major non-cardiac surgery. In these patients, we did a brain MRI between day two and nine after surgery. And by using diffusion wave imaging, when you see a lesion, we know it's in a stroke that happened in the last nine days. So we know that these are acute events that happen around the time of surgery. We had 12 centers in nine countries that participated. The results were consistent across centers, and this was a representative sample of patients having surgery in these, in these centers, including orthopedic surgery. 7% um, of the patients after surgery had a new covert stroke on their MRI. That is, the stroke wasn't appreciated clinically, but these patients had a new stroke that had happened in the last several days around the time of their surgery. And importantly, we demonstrated that um, these, in, these covert strokes increase the risk of patients getting perioperative delirium over twofold. And most importantly, they increase the risk of cognitive decline at one year. That is 42% of the patients who had a covert stroke had cognitive decline one year after surgery. And 29% of the patients who did not have a covert stroke had cognitive decline one year after surgery. We also demonstrated that these covert strokes were associated with an increased risk of overt stroke in TIA in the coming year over a fourfold increase. So I think when you look at just the monitoring and what happens, we really need to learn from the story of anesthesiology and the potential for the third paradigm shift to improve surgical outcomes consists, I believe, of two components. One is a new perioperative care service model that is dedicated and available to co-manage patients with surgeons on surgical floors, but also importantly to help transition patients into the home setting. And we also have to bring remote automated non-invasive monitoring technology to improve these outcomes because patients are on narcotics and frequently may be in a compromised state and will not recognize it if we're not actually monitoring for it. Um, this brings us to a few quick trials I'm gonna tell you about. So the first one is the SMART view trial. And unfortunately, Mike McGillian, who's one of our very close colleagues, um, was not able to be with us here tonight. And Mike has been playing a major role leading our group in terms of what we've been doing, looking at remote automated monitoring technology. And one of the trials that we're doing is the SmartView trial, which is a randomized control trial of 800 patients who are admitted to a surgical ward after cardiac or vascular surgery. And these patients are randomized either to standard care or to an intervention where they get the Philips remote automated monitoring technology with alerts and monitoring into the home setting. And the primary endpoint we're trying to look at reducing is possible readmission and ER visits. This just shows you what the technology looks like in the hospital. So patients here have uh, an automated blood pressure cuff, they have an oxygen saturation, they have a heart rate monitor and a respiratory rate monitor. This is being monitored and if certain parameters are met, an alert goes to the nurse or if it's, if it's at a certain threshold, it'll go to the race team, and this alerts people to come take care of the patient. And then when patients go home, they go home with a tablet that allows them to interact with us virtually. Um, they also have a thermometer, they have a blood pressure cuff, which also measures heart rate, a oxygen saturation monitor, and also a scale. And we're hoping by using this, we can actually improve their outcomes and prevent readmissions. Um, SmartView, we've randomized just under 600 patients, but it's had to be put on hold because of COVID. But at the time of COVID, we also took advantage of this opportunity to initiate a trial looking at remote monitoring technology and virtual care in the setting of COVID. And as background, um, to facilitate physical distancing and reduce the risk of COVID-19 and to maximize bed availability initially for COVID patients, all the hospitals stopped elective surgeries. Um, uh, now, there still was a need for patients to have semi-urgent cancer surgery, urgent hip fracture, valve obstruction, or emergent surgery, rupture AAA surgeries. And the reality is research shows, as Flavia mentioned earlier, that patients having a semi-urgent, urgent, or emergent surgery, that in fact, 15 to 25% of those patients will either be readmitted to the hospital or come to the emergency room within a 30-day period. And if this happens, this is obviously gonna create problems for us in terms of not having beds available. And as we ramp up to start doing elective surgeries, again, it's gonna limit our ability to even catch up on the huge backlog in Ontario, there's 50,000 case backlog for elective surgery. And so we need to find a way to keep people out of the hospital so we can try to catch up. So the primary endpoint 
is to determine in patients uh, discharge after non-elective surgery, the effect of virtual care with RAM technology compared to standard care on days alive at home. This is an investigator-initiated trial. Um, we're going to include 900 patients, um, and uh, we're including patients who are age 40 uh, or greater and are being discharged after non-elective surgery. Um, we have nine centers in Ontario, Alberta, um, and uh, Manitoba and Nova Scotia. The study intervention is a tablet computer with RAM technology. So you can see the, the nurses seen here can interact directly with the patient. And we also get all of their vitals brought up on a screen in front of us. And it also gives flags for anything that's out of normal boundaries and all these things that we've set up. And with this technology, we can measure their blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, temperature and, and weight. Patients also do daily recovery surveys for 30 days and the virtual care nurses interact with the patients every day for the first 15 days and then every other day from day 16 to 30. And the nurses then escalate care to physicians based upon reaching certain parameters or if certain problems exist and then we're looped into this care. And this just shows you the technology that we're using the CloudVX um, system, which allows us to measure all of these parameters in these patients. And this tablet gives patients 24 hour access virtually to a nurse, physician, and the surgeons can also be looped into the care on these patients. Um, where we're ultimately going though, is um, in this area showing you this monitor. So for vision two, we'll be using the tricorder device, um, which was developed by CloudDX and won the X Prize internationally um, two years ago for boldest health invention. But what this device allows us to do is that it's, it's very comfortable to wear, but it gives you continuous non-invasive blood pressure, heart rate, heart rhythm, temperature, oxygen saturation, respiratory rate, five lead ECG, movement, body position, fall detection, sleep analysis, and steps. And patients can take this into the home setting and we can continually monitor this data. And I think once we get to this place, It'll be like in the OR when you have someone where you're getting vitals continuously on them and you'll just be in a much better position to detect who's starting to go in the wrong direction and then respond to this in a way that'll improve outcomes. I wanna also just finish by mentioning that we started the division of perioperative care a year ago now in um, Hamilton. And this is a multidisciplinary division that includes um, the key stakeholders of anesthesia, medicine, nursing, rehab sciences, and surgery. It's both an academic division, but also a clinical service. The clinical services co-manage with the surgeons, the patients um, in the hospital, and then also help to transition patients into the home setting. Um, we've been doing this for a year now in cardiac surgery um, at the Hamilton General, and Emily, Emily Bellicote has been leading that. And Amin Patel is the site leader for the Jervinsky Hospital, and we'll be launching this on July 14th at the Jurabinsky Hospital with orthopedic surgery and the, and the surgeons up at the Jurabinsky. And our goal is to cut perioperative mortality complications and readmissions in half in the coming decade. So my final takeaway messages are is that patients undergo surgery for important reasons. There's a need to improve surgical outcomes to the point where anyone can have surgery. We should learn from the history of anesthesiology and a division of perioperative care with new care models after surgery and into the home setting with RAM technology has the potential to potentially be the third paradigm shift um, in the surgical setting. Thank you very much.